Mary Webster called me today and she was so excited she hardly knew what to do. She had heard the tape on Mary 20 times. 20 times. And she's flying down the plane tomorrow with an earplug in her ear and listening it to as many times as she can before she gets to Florida for two ashrams. Now I want to ask you a question. Has anybody in here got that kind of vision? The answer is N-O. But it touches your heart when I tell you about it on 20 times. See, I've raved and carried on and jumped and hollered over that tape uh, hardly more than anything else. Mary is the world's greatest Christian. Had she the slightest bit of pride, she would have heard it maybe two or three. She doesn't. She's so humble. And if God's in it and the Holy Spirit's working, she'll just listen to it over and over again. She told me things that I can't utter to you today. But she wanted me to start a preaching class for preachers. She said, oh, Oliver, can you have a school and teach preachers how to preach? Well, I don't even know how to preach. What are you going to do with that? I don't. I, what am I going to Point one. I don't even know what point one is. Point two. If I don't know point one, what point one is, I don't know what point two is, David. I wouldn't know more how to structure a preaching class. The only thing I know we could do is get the young preachers here, like these fellows, by God's grace, and just, just uh, disciple them. Let them learn through osmosis. See? That's the only thing I know, David. But Mary was sincere. She said, oh, Oliver, could you get a preaching class started? Well, you see, there's fundamentals in preaching, and I, I flunked them. I, I made an A, but, uh, you know, the one they called me to preach, they don't like allegorical sermons in preaching. And when I said, Jesus, which sermon do you want me to preach? He said, preach the one they don't like. Which, mean a, which meant a deep, deep death for me because I was, I was a straight-A student. I knew that my grades were going to be fairly good. And, um, and I was trying to, you know, make a positive impression because my name wasn't all that positive. And I didn't want to get up there and appear like a fool. Uh, when it would come class time to share, well, I didn't share much. Not unless God started operating with me did I share. I kept my mouth shut because I was on the spot. Anything I had to say would be suspect anyway. But see, God would work it where I'd have an opening somewhere. Somebody come up and say, how about this? Or I'd say, well, now, you know the class I was in or said, well, you know, Oliver has a church and he said he does everything wrong, but somehow it turns out right. That's what they said in preaching seminar. Well, so I'm here before the cameras and the cameras are rolling, television screen up there and I'm going to have to preach. And I said, Lord, which sermon is it? Prayed over what sermon it was and he had me preach on losing Jesus, which I've preached a half a dozen times in 10 years in this place, more than any other sermon. How many has heard me preach on losing Jesus? You remember the sermon. Okay, see, a third or a quarter of this audience knows that Jesus said preach that one. Well, it's all allegorical. It's, it's all, you spiritualize it. And they do not like that in preaching class. Jesus would have been, had big problems in preaching class. <laughs> Jesus said, preach that one. Yes, Janet. Did you hear that, fellas? Barry Doss, who's in seminary, said the best one was over here. His brother told him... His brother told him that the best seminary was right here. Jerry told him that. See, because he's a graduate of Anderson College and he could have gone on seminary, but his brother said the best one's right here. I'm thankful to Jesus. So Mary was really stirred today. I can't tell you what she said because uh, unless you were very, very close to me, it would sound a certain way. So I can't say it. But Mary said something outstanding. Did you all learn about it today? Did you all find out what she said today? Daddy, I called you and told you. Because, see, I knew Daddy would know that there would, by God's grace there wouldn't be any pride in me. But Mary, I'll say this much, by God's grace, that Mary is probably more stirred over our ministry here than any other ministry in the world. In fact, I, I won't say probably, I'll just tell you it's that way. 
So she's trying to, you know what she told the folks on the East Coast, the churches of God on the, East Co on the West Coast? She, she gets in them and she starts talking. She starts talking about a young fella, about eight or nine years old, that jumped straight out of his seat while an old time evangelist was preaching at the end of 70 minutes and hollered, hollered, no, don't stop. She tells him that story. And it, it, when she finishes, she didn't tell him who it is. When she finishes, somebody will get up out of the audience or they'll come up and say, who, who was that? We want to know who that was that's got that kind of hunger for God. Who is that that's that hunger for God? She said, his name's Oliver Holmes, Scott Depot Christ Fellowship. What? She's just plastering all over. So we're hanging on because we know what that means. We know that that means an invitation somewhere. And we don't, I don't want to go unless Jesus is really in it. I don't want to, by flesh, I don't want to go anyway. But she's telling this worldwide. She's telling this everywhere. Because she's trying to tell about what God's doing here. Mary Webster, the, she's one of the greatest Christians in the world. But Brother Helm thinks she's the greatest soul winner on the earth today. He's Stanley Jones' colleague and secretary. And to think that she loves this little preacher boy. Is, uh, now that's not why I'm stirred tonight. I'm stirred over this sermon. But that, that helped me today because she talked and she said, oh, Oliver, she said, my sermon, your sermon has put me under conviction. She said, uh, I just listened to Mary and she said, I was making a pumpkin pie and she said, I stuck a toothpick in and uh, she said, I tried to pitch it to the wastebasket and it fell on the floor and she said, I got aggravated. Now, Mary, Mary's not a very aggravating type person. So it, it didn't mean she had a, she fell out on the floor and kicked and screamed and foamed at the mouse. Not, not that. She just felt inside she was aggravated. So she got the toothpick back up and tried it, or yeah, tried to pitch it again and it fell on the floor again. And then she said, the conviction of the sermon hit me. She said, my Lord, what kind of person am I? Jesus spoke to her and said, Mary, don't you remember what Oliver Yeah, said? Mary, don't you remember what Oliver just preached? She got, she got out and said, oh God, I want you to forgive me. She'd been listening to this sermon 20 times and God convicted her over carnality. Oh God, I want you to forgive me for being aggravated because this toothpick wouldn't go in the wastebasket. I doubt that you could tell it much on the outward appearance, but she knew how she felt inside. You ever feel like kicking something? That's carnality. If it's not a holy kick, it's carnality. It's the difference between kicking the devil and kicking him because you're aggravated. And, and the Lord brought her under conviction over that very sermon. Over what did Mary think? Now, I can't remember what was in there that's convicting. All I know is that when Jesus spoke through me by his grace, there was great power surging through me without let up for the entire 45 minutes that I spoke. I mean, it was just mm, 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 just on and on and on and it never quit. Just, oh, it was as if I were, was eating honey for 45 minutes. See, I can remember. And I don't remember but a few times that's ever happened in my life. So I, I'm real thankful that, that the servant of the Lord is stirred, that the handmaid of God is stirred. And as she travels down tomorrow, may God give her, she, you know what she said to me? I can tell you this because you'll enjoy this. She said, you're my valentine. I said, you're, well, I, that stirred me up. She said, I, I love you. You're, you're my valentine. She's like a mother to me. And oh, I'm telling you, I'm thrilled about it tonight, but God's grace. Praise the Lord. Travel in the life of God's people is a sign of validation or certifying that one is genuinely of God. Now, if there's another sermon written like this in the universe, I want to know where it is. If there's any other sermon that opens like this anywhere in the land, I want to know where it is. David, you got 20 cents. You got the same set of books I got. I've got Joseph Parker and a whole string of, I don't know how many thousands of sermons I've got. But I, if there's one that opens like this, I want to know where it is. Wish I'd have had this one 10 years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago. Seven. I needed it seven years ago. This sermon right here. Travel in the life of God's people is a sign that those people are genuinely of God. 
That's a big statement. And I know that you're uh, forbearing with me and wondering what in this world. That's all right. You can, want, you can wonder about that. But contrary to some person's opinions, according to the Word of God, this mobility is a sign of validity. The man Moses and the people, the children of Israel, were under a cloud of guidance which caused them to pass through the Red Sea. And you don't pass through anything unless you're on a journey. And if you pass through the Red Sea under the guidance of the cloud of God, you're baptized into a man's ministry, in this case Moses, and that ministry had mobility. And it was a sign of validity. Travel or journeying in and of itself doesn't certify anything. But traveling regularly at the promptings of God validate that one is of God. What's my text on this? Well, turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and uh, we'll find the text in the context. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul's apostleship is under question. And he's attempting to answer uh, the questions that are being raised. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Be a good place, I think, to start at the 21st verse. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites, these people who have Paul under attack? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. There's your text. My sign of apostleship is that I travel an awful lot. Now, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm not an apostle. I'm speaking of Paul. In perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in factings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak, who is offended, and I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities." The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. I present to you, Paul said, my credentials, that I am a man of God. And one sign of that validity is mobility, that I journey often. Now right here, folks, it's time for you and I to get awake and get alive. Right here's time for you and I to wake up. Right here's for you and I time. Here's something that's going to be offered to the congregation here that's not known throughout Christendom. Why? Because it's all right for a man to go once on a trip, maybe twice. But if he travels regularly, they say he's the opposite of what he is. You know it and I know it. If he goes and he goes and he goes and he's called of God, they say he's the opposite of what he is. Instead of saying, well, he must be a man of God, they're saying just the opposite. I faced this in my early days here over and over again. Journeying often is an apostolic sign. The word apostle means one who is sent. And in the context of the New Testament, it means one who is sent by God. The greatest man ever sent by God was Jesus Christ. Thus the writer to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 3, 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, 
Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not only the greatest of the apostles, he took the greatest journey ever taken by man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is, the Greek word here for dwelt is tented or kept, or kept moving. The Word became flesh and traveled among us. Right? Sojourn among us. Or as the Apostles' Creed states, he was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, dead, and buried, uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. What a journey. Greatest journey ever recorded. Brother, I mean it with all my heart. The Word became flesh and sojourned among us and tended among us, traveled among us. Boy, when I think of that, I think of when he said, I must needs go through Samaria. Didn't want him to do it. But he was the apostle of God. He was sent of God. That means he was going through Samaria. That means he was going through Perea. That means he was going into Judea and into Galilee. And once when he went back into Judea so to Jerusalem, Thomas said, no, you can't do it. Well, if you're going to do it, he said, let's just all go with him and die. And that's pretty much the issue for all of times. What a journey to Hades and back. From death to life. From heaven to earth. To hell, to earth, and back to heaven. Sent by God. But Paul was an apostle too. And he evidences his apostleship with these words, in journeyings often. Paul, too, was under a cloud, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, a side point that I want to note in this journey, something that I think will be helpful to us. Oh, may God help us. When I think of the mercy that God has provided on these journeys, when I think of how God's kept us well or healed us while we were in travel, when I think how he's gotten us over and back over all these journeys, I want you to know that's a special providence, a special of mercy of God, which Paul did not have. Because the sign of journeying for God is trouble. And yet you and I insist in our minds so often, if this journey's of God, then we want the least trouble possible. So God has to do it to protect his servant. Oh, we demand it. If God's in this, why the trouble? The question, my friends, is if God isn't, is in it, why not trouble? How are we to differ from the Apostle Paul when he had, he said, in journeyings often, man, he said, I was beaten, I was shipwrecked, I was in the deep a day and a night, I was in perils of waters and with robbers, and my own countrymen beat me up. I was in the wilderness, I was in trouble all the time. Who taught you your theology anyway? Who's been teaching you from a little person these things that are so wrong? Who told you that it was supposed to be uh, 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 free, uh, free of trouble all the way? It's the opposite. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And yet because of the demands upon men's consciences, we've had so little trouble. And we thank God for it, but the sign is the opposite. But it was the quantities of travel, travel under divine guidance. And let me tell you something, in all these journeys, the devil's fault. He's done his utmost to break men's minds and to do this and that and the other, but we've not talked a lot about the troubles nor the upheaval. Some of you know what's happening in this community over this, tra over this journey. That's why I didn't want you to go to the bank unless, you, unless your finances were in top-notch shape. 
because I, I didn't want it to reflect upon the journey that God, the, the journey that God ordained. See, that's why I wanted everybody to be careful. Because, see, the community's stirred. The banks are stirred. The people are stirred. That's the way it's supposed to be. But we want to give them as little uh, weapons as possible. And because God loves us so much, He's helped us all of these journeys and given the enemy as little ammunition as possible. Boy, we've gotten off scot-free. How long will it be from 80 to 100 that you and I get off scot-free? Not forever, believe me. Not forever. When are we going to land? I'm not talking about travels, but at home or abroad. When are we going to land in jail? When are we going to land in prison? When is our countrymen going to beat us up? When are they going to do more than talk about us? Will you know it to be a sign of validity? And will you keep your mobility? Boy, what a message for the army of God. That's a byline. <laughs> I'll give Lori my notes so she can take them back to Anderson. But I got a few critics up there. I got a few friends too, but a few critics, and they need this kind of thing. They just need the scriptures. Find out what we've been trying to do, what God's been trying to do with our lives in these several years. But it was the quantities of travel under divine guidance that certified his being an apostle directly commissioned and sent by Jesus Christ. Thus he writes, in journeyings often. In other words, I travel much. And I present that to you that I'm a man of God. You see, most pulpit committees will tell a man he can't hold but uh, one revival a year or two at the most. And he surely can't take more than one Holy Land journey, you know, any more than once ever. 12 years or 10 years. Oh well, yeah, that's the way they feel about it. So if a man tries to present his credentials unto his people, now a man that's worth his salt doesn't want to go, but a man that's worth his salt denies himself. I was thinking about how this last year, 1979, I didn't want to go anywhere. And the Holy Spirit said early part of the year, you're going quite a few places told me, yeah, that in February, I said, you're going quite a few places. And I thought, oh, Jesus, have mercy on me. Well, I went quite a few places, more places than I wanted to go by far, at least twice as much, if not more times than that as much, because I didn't want to leave home. Often means consistency. And that is what very few men who profess godliness have. Often means I consistently do this. This is a sign. You see, it's not once in a while. It's the sign of, of regularity, a sign of consistency. I'll show you how valuable that is. Dean Newberry of Anderson College was my dean when I was in seminary before I went back. Whenever I mentioned Brother Robert Morgan to him, his face lit up and he said, You know, the sign that Bob is really a man of God and truly being called is that he, when he was called to be evangelist, he has kept on the road longer than any other church of God evangelist. Because most men go in and out of evangelism at will. Or when the finances get good, they go in. When they don't get good, they go out. And Brother Dean Newberry said, Brother Morgan, I can tell that he has really been called of God because he's, now the reason he's not traveling today because there's no invitations. Men have killed his reputation. He goes once in a while. We want him back here. But the man who's called to be an evangelist, they killed his reputation. So fortunately, he has a local fellowship like here whereby he may preach the gospel. Thankful for that. But as long as he had the invitations, he went. And he told us that if it weren't for his mother's income and for now for revival for a day, there would be no way to sustain his ministry. His mother and his daddy backed him. And I think one other person backed him because the offerings from the church were so pitifully little throughout the time that he traveled as an evangelist. Now, think of Brother Ham. When he left to go with God, he never turned around and went back. He just kept going. 
When I joined him in 1966, I think the income was something like three or four thousand dollars. It didn't make him any difference. He's traveling just as much today when the income's more than that. That, that in those, he went right on in those days. And he, when, it, when God called him out, he just kept going and he kept going and he kept going. And all through the decade of the 70s, when God calls him abroad, he just keeps going. He keeps going. When it, whenever the churches would shut him out, God would open up another door. He'd just wait and tarry and he'd keep going. See, evangelism was one of the hardest things that a man could do. It would be the, it would be the phase of the ministry that I would dread most. I would dread it. I'm, I'm trusting. I, I said, Jesus, I trust that I don't dread it so much you don't call me to it. I'll just not try to dread it that much. But, but trying to have your whole living out of the trunk of your car and going and going and going and going and going and going is almost mind-boggling to me. I like to be in one place. Now, I want you to notice something. But being in one place is not a sign of genuineness. There is a tendency for you and I to lock into one place. Now, don't overread me here. There's another sign of the man who moves that's not of God at all. But get, understand me in the spirit. If you love me and you've been praying and trusting God, you're following right along with me. I'm, I'm, uh, you're programmed with me. You're on my wavelength, my wavelength tonight. But see, the, the, the mobility is a sign of genuineness. And mobility in its consistency and it's traveling also is a sign of uh, genuineness. To travel often is a sure way to upset the carnal in yourselves, in others, and in the community. <laughs> and in this phase, God has called upon us to travel often. But travel or mobility has always been a sign of the people of God. Turn with me to Numbers 9, 15. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely the tent of the testimony. And even there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that, the children of Israel journeyed and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. You see, in your own spiritual life, in terms of your own interior life, there is a mobility. There is a journeying guided by God. In your own life every day, there is a journeying often guided by God as you're waiting and as you're trusting. Sure, we're positioned in Taze Valley. We're positioned in the Kanawha Valley Basin and off the edge of the mountains here, Racine and roundabout Boone County. But, uh, but get what I'm saying. Get this movement of God under divine orders often. And that's the key as to whether movement is right or wrong. When Bill Browning, before he passed away, he told me 95% of the singing groups traveling the country was out of divine order. That's in another phase of understanding because he knew they needed to be home. See, for tra the traveling under the guidance of God often is the sign of validity. So it's not travel in itself because it can be the opposite sign. But people have often looked at me and said he's not of God because he travels so much. Or my wife is not of God because she travels so much. Or we're going to experience certain, certain difficulties because we travel so much. Well, the opposite true. The opposite is true. I'm not going to make it unless I do what God says. My wife's not going to make it unless she does what God says. I'm not going to have healing and health from a family. And if I travel, there ought to be a given number of Holy Ghost permitted troubles as a sign that I'm on the right track rather than the opposite. I, I know I'm giving you a lot to feed on. You, you all act as if I've shocked you so bad that you don't know hardly what to do with it. But you're responding wonderfully too. I, I am so thrilled that I can share this with you tonight. Mobility was a sign of our father Abraham. 
And he was the father of our faith. And the Lord said unto him, Now the Lord uh, had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. That's what he did with, with Larry and Sarah and Michael. All you native West Virginians want to be mighty thankful that, that you obey God down in the interior life and that the Lord's given you your homeland as your journeying land also. Now that's really something when he does that. See, you're very fortunate because there's a bunch of us here that are adopted sons and we were not allowed to stay home. I was not allowed to stay home in the coal fields of West Virginia. I mean, of West Frankfort, Illinois. I was called to the coal fields of West Virginia. And I've been happy about it. I've been thrilled about it. But I want you to know that it's an unusual privilege to stay home and yet journey. To stay home and journey often. To stay home and yet to obey God. The paradoxes are here, but I, I think you're getting the point. The sign of the people of God is a tent, not a temple. And Israel, according to Stephen, Israel was out of order when she built the temple. Say, now wait a minute, Brother Ho. God gave Solomon and David the plans. Yes, she was out of order to have a king. But when she said she's got to have a king, then God chose the king. She was out of order to build a temple. But when she was determined to do it, then the Lord provided the plans for it. But that was not his sign of his people. I preached this years ago. The tabernacle was the sign of his temple, of his people, because it had mobility. Because it had impermanency. Because its symbol suggests what was true of the people of God. A pilgrim people, not a stationary people. And it grieved God. He said, David, sent word by David to David by his prophet, said, Tell David not to do it. Said, can, can this thing contain me? Notice this in, in the uh, passage in Acts. Now, what I'm telling you now got Stephen dead. What I'm telling you right now got Stephen stoned. So you want to play, play close attention? See, there, we've got some sacred cows too. We think that things have to be a certain way. And then when God's servant comes along and God's got his, see, we, when God led back there, yes, but did he lead because you were determined to go that anyway? What is his perfect will? His perfect will was not to have a temple because the mobility of the tent, the mobility of the tabernacle was to yield to our bodies, which were to be the temple. And the temple in heaven, which is stationary, is God and the Son. And they give the light. Oh, I'm pretty excited about this. Turn with me to Acts and see what got these folks upset. And I mean they got upset. <laughs> because, because they had a, a fictitious sanctity. They had an idea that the temple itself, in and of itself, was something holy. And it wasn't. Remember when Trophimus went in there, or they thought Trophimus went in there, uh, they got Paul for that, and an awful thing happened because that's where Paul's death began because they were upset over him taking one of us, a Gentile, into the sacred precincts. Notice what Stephen says in chapter 7, 48 verse. Now he's preaching, he's under a great anointing. He's about ready to get killed too. He's upset the Sanhedrin, upset the leading church leaders or the leading uh, religious leaders. And he says, how be it the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? And then he goes on to say something that's so tremendous. God gave him courage to look with love, mind you, at his brethren and say, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? 
and they have slain them which, have, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Well, of course, that got them. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Because you say something about the temple. If you remember, that was part of the charges against our Lord. He said, this temple may be torn down, but he said, I'll, I'll, I'll resurrect in three days. What did he mean? He'll re resurrect a spiritual temple. Of course, he could have he uh, called all the angels in, had the big one built all over in three days. He's able to do that too. But that's not what he was referring to. But you see, when Stephen said this, it upset them. Their mindset was for permanency. Their mindset was for not tenting or mobility. Their mind was uh, for staying in one place, regardless of what God said. And their mindset was building something that suggested something foreign about the nature of God, and the temple did. The sign of the people of God is a tent, not a temple. And the truth that got Stephen stoned to death was that, was that he... He um, uh, opened the wounds of their sacred cow. The nature of God's people is that of mobility, not permanence. That's why we sung a while ago, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up. Now, folks, this will help us all tonight because all too often you and I are, are, are laying up treasures on earth instead of laying up treasures in heaven. And we live our life during the day. See, as to whether I'm getting to you or not, maybe I can cause you to react to this. <clears throat> uh, our life from day to day and what we do with our mindset tells us whether we're laying treasures up here or laying treasures up in heaven. You decide that. But it depends on whether you have a tent as in the symbol of your heart or a temple. It depends on whether you've got permanency with regard to this earth and its things or whether you know, friend, you're just a pilgrim and you're just passing through. And everything, your life, your business, your home, your, your weekends, your vacations, everything is geared toward mobility. Well, I mean by mobility, not in much going, but in the, uh, the impermanency of the situation just to move when God says move and to do what God says and to be under this cloud and to be baptized into the ministry that he's brought you to. The tent symbolizes the barriers or the, temp, the, uh, the tent suggested that the barriers between God were impermanent barriers, but the temple suggested permanent barriers. See, the way it was made, I want you to look at the curtain. The curtain was how thick, David, do you remember? Six inches? Six inches thick. Boy, I want you to know when, God, when Christ died, what did God do with that thing? He ripped it from the top to the bottom. He got rid of that symbol right now. Just ripped it. Of course, there was something else involved. Jesus was our atonement. But, there, but to have that curtain so thick in the tabernacle, that curtain was not that thick. There was a curtain because they were not permitted to go into the Holy of Holies. But not something six inches thick. They said that, that, that you can, uh, scholars say, that you could have put uh, oxen at both ends of that curtain and had them go off in two different directions, a good team of oxen, six apiece, and it wouldn't tear. That's the wrong symbol. That's the wrong symbol. That's the wrong symbol. Permanency is, too, is wrong. See, I can see that down through the ages, down through the centuries, you and I have uh, what, was, what was thin and filmy and yet could only be broken by God, we've built into something more permanent. We've suggested to people that there's greater barriers than what they are. And we suggested that the barriers are permanent. But I want you to know the mighty Christ who took this journey onto this earth and tended among us, he tore down those barriers and, and he removed the middle wall of perdition and reconciled Jew and Gentile and reconciled husband and wife and reconciled neighbor and neighbor and reconciled black and white and reconciled men and women of this earth and boys and girls. But you couldn't get that feeling with the temple. You did get it with the tabernacle. I'm pretty excited about this. 
The tent symbolizes, symbolizes the insufficiency of the sacrificial order. And the temple suggested that the sacrificial order was permanent. Boy, what happened to the temple in 70? She was gone. Titus saw to that. But Jesus Christ had come and he made atonement for our soul and tore down these barriers that are so, uh, so looking, uh, look to be so permanent. Yet God was saying through the symbol of the tent and through the sign of mobility, these things are not going to be forever. I'm going to open up a way through the blood of my son for you to go in to the very throne of God. The symbol of that tent suggests pliableness or malleableness rather than rigidity. Well, I think how good that'd be for us in today's legalistic society and legalistic religion. How wonderful it would be, folks, if we'd bend a little more. You know, when you stand rigid, you break easier. And a lot of emotional disorders that we have is because we're too rigid on the inside. Most emotional orders we do have means that we've, there's a rigidity with it. Because if, we're bend, if we can bend like the palm tree, then when the storm's over, we'll straighten up. But if we're like a telephone pole, we may snap. Because there are winds strong enough to snap a telephone pole and everything else that is that permanent. Well, do you see why I was excited today? Paul says, said to these accusers, I am an apostle and the sign that I submit to you is that I journey often. And the context of that sign is that I'm in a lot of trouble all the time. Of Abraham it was said, by faith when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. I would better stop here and say, native West Virginians, don't be too rigid about being a West Virginian. That's a sure way to get you out of these hills and valleys if you're going to obey God. Don't ever say, I'll never leave this place because you've just challenged the God of the universe and, and count on it, folks, you're going. You're going. And I know not everybody believes me, but I'm telling you what God's like. There's a man that once said over in the old building that he wasn't going to ever leave this ministry. And I, I wasn't going to ever run him off. Well, he was right. I wasn't. He's right about that. But he said he never was going to leave. He oughtn't have said that. Every man that's ever said that's gone or will be going. Everybody that's ever said that. I don't dare make a statement like that. I challenge the God of the universe when I make statements like that. And so I took my first trip and this gentleman was aggravated. Or the second or third trip he got aggravated. And the third trip he was really aggravated. But the fourth trip was too much for him to swallow. And it aggravated him so much he left. Contrary to what he had said before. I didn't know this till it was all over. All I knew was that in that last year that he was with me, he was as black as pitch. I'd say, oh God, what's the matter? See, disobedience and criticism makes your face black. Makes you look terrible. Sometimes you can't tell it, but anybody that's trying to walk with God can tell it. So I wonder, what's the matter? I, I, see, I had such love for this brother. I didn't know anything about it. He knew it was the matter because he visited him in the home. Boy, when he'd get in the home, he'd let it fly against me. I didn't know it. I'd just see him coming. I'd get my arms around him and I'd visit and praise God. And, and Stephen would just about be on the eggshells because he knew the fellow was after me. But the thing that got him was number four trip. And he couldn't, you see, you may think you're not going anywhere, but God's got a little more than you can stomach. You just think you're big enough to oppose him. I'm not big enough to oppose him. If I make a statement like that, friend, you can count on it. I'm going to have to do the opposite. You know, don't you remember what Brother Ham said? said you, you may not like shouting, and you, but don't you ever say I'm not going to shout because you're going to be on the, in the shouting business when God gets a hold of you. And that's what's happened to so many people. 
They're opposed to it. They're aggravated when somebody shouts. And then when God really gets a hold of their soul, they're the biggest shouter in the place. It's the only way to bring them to humility. It's the only way to keep God in control and to keep the principle of self-denial operating. Huh. I'm really serious about this not telling God what to do. It's a serious thing. It's a serious thing. Please don't say, I'm not going to do said so and so, or, or I'm not going to. That's the surest way to get you into it. Now, it may take one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, seven. It may take 10, it may take 20, but God will have you doing what you said you weren't going to do. Whether you like it or not, He may have you carried out on a stretcher. But one way or another, you're going to face God with declarations like that. There's something in it. So don't be too rigid and don't be too obstinate. He said, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles. You know what the word tabernacle means? Dwelling in tents. With Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Oh, it's one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture. And this is what Abraham did. He, he traversed, he traveled. Well, left his home, left all of his friends and all of his ties. He left under a cloud also, under the guidance of God. He was baptized in to the ministry of Jesus Christ, if you please. I don't know who else he was answerable to, but Jesus himself. And as he traveled, he was blessed of God, but he never quit traveling. Because in one sense, the promise was never fulfilled. They were to wait upon us before the promise could really be fulfilled. Paul said, after he submitted this sign of validity in his ministry, he made a statement in 2 uh, later on in that same chapter or in the next chapter that I want to bring to you here in closing. 11th verse in the 12th verse. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me for I ought to have been commended of you for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The sign of an apostle. Under a cloud, under guidance, journeying often in peril. And so he says, I submit this to you. We don't know how rigid we are until the storm breaks. And we really haven't had any storms yet. Not to amount to anything. How in the world can we compare our life to the Apostle Paul? We can't do it. But God has trained us for a decade. Those of you who have been with me 10 years or more, or for five years, or for four, or for three, or for six, or for seven, He has trained us And what is the sign of a genuine people of God? Mobility. Pliability. Impermanency, not permanency. The right symbol. I'm thankful for this church. And God said build it. But back in the days of the Israelites, he didn't want anything like this. He wanted a tabernacle. In order that would be recorded in Scripture, the right symbol. It would suggest always the right things. It touches my heart on the right things. Well, if I'd had this sermon, how many years ago did the Lord witness to your heart, Stephen? Seven years ago, it would have been most helpful to me. 
But today, while I was in my studying, thinking of travels, those three words just leaped right up at me. In journeyings often. I said, oh, my Lord. Oh, this is great. Oh, I'm excited. In journeyings often. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought about the sign of the genuineness of God's people. Mobility, journeying. Who in the world would ever in what decade and, a, and one half of a year travel abroad 16 times? Well, there might be a servant of God called upon me to do that. And there might be a people of God called upon to accompany him. One or more of those 16 journeys. It could be that on that 16th journey, a hundred people might go to Israel. It's happening. It's the sign of genuineness. I want you to look at the validity of this thing. I want you to look at us over this decade. See, I'm so excited that, I, see, I didn't bring my gong in. I need a gong now. It's all right. You don't have to get it. But see, that alerts people because I've had people go to sleep in the last 10 minutes. It's, it's, I'm so excited and I've pulled every bell I know how to pull because I can see that it's revolutionary what I'm saying. I can see that it, that it clears up a lot of things. What the apostle says, Bob, you've been so happy. I don't know what in the world. And if you, if you can't see the carryover in terms of the literal journeys, see the spiritual meaning in terms of the interior life. Because you see, you and I have certain symbols in front of our, our eyes. They're either wrong or they're right. And if they're wrong, we're going to break. They better be right. Because if they're wrong, also, they say, they say wrong things to people around us. Did you know that the people who are hungry for God, when they hear of us going and they hear about us traveling in love and in music and love, which are the two universal languages everywhere, everybody, almost everybody appreciates this. I had a man tell me the other day he didn't like music, but there's few men like that or few women like that on the face of the earth. Most everybody the world over loves music. And you know something, whether they like it, whether they admit it or not, they all like love. Did you know that the group from this church and from Revival Far Day at Large, when they travel, did you know that the reputation abroad is that there are, there's no other group like this that ever comes or goes in foreign countries? Well, Holger, are you saying something stuck up? No, I'm trying to tell you what their report is. Because as pitiful as we are, God's opened up our hearts a little bit toward loving foreign peoples. And they feel it. Yeah, they feel it. And so in our journeyings, thank God he's kept us from peril. And yet he has spoken the language of love and of music and delivered his message. Because primarily in your journeying, the spirit of God is so important. People feed off the spirit. I believe Quite frankly, well, I want to say this. Why haven't we stopped? Well, we're just like Abraham. We haven't found a city yet. Not really. Holy Ghost revival hadn't come yet. Why is Brother Ham still traveling the earth? He's still trying to find the people of God. He's found a few, but why is he still going? He's still trying to find the people of God. He's still trying to find somebody who will die out and be one and be all for God. He's still looking for the city. Abraham looked for it too. And he staggered not through unbelief at the promise of God. It's great. It's great. In journeyings, often, the very word means consistent. And you and I know down deep in our heart that if somebody's not consistent, we don't have confidence in them. Oh, that's enough to... Make me shout. Well, oh, hallelujah.
Tonight, maybe it's more appropriate than even Sunday night. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Nor pain nor death can enter there. Boy, that's one thing to get out of, the, isn't it? Who wants that forever and ever? I feel like traveling on. It's glittering towers, the sun outshine. I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine. I feel like traveling on. Let others seek a home below. I'm a pilgrim. I'm sojourning. I feel like traveling on. Which flames devour and waves overflow, but I feel like traveling on. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on. Until that blessed home I see, I feel like traveling home. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling home. That was the spirit of God's people when they were really under the cloud and obeying Him.